That was on um, uh, Thursday. Tuesday. Is it Thursday? Oh, Thursday. <laughs> yeah. So uh, time moved quite very fast. <laughs> so many places uh, I had to move to, and uh, not everything had happened according to the itinerary which was uh, earlier planned. But uh, we saw the hand of God in everything. Uh, we started in a place called Butuan, where we had uh, uh, a well-attended convention. That is where Brother Osel is, so there were different believers coming from uh, different places, and uh, the, 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 the Lord granted us his message in, one, in having such wonderful meetings. Then uh, when we came, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, from Butuan, I moved to Manila, and in Manila there is a small church which has just started, these believers can't uh, manage to travel in far places, so uh, uh, Brother Raphael, the young brother to Brother Osel, uh, he arranged a meeting place where believers gather. So we, we just had one or two services there, then we moved to some other places. And uh, it was encouraging. There is one place which we visited uh, together with a couple who were very helpful during the <coughs> missionary trip. And uh, something happened there that strengthened my faith because uh, I had planned a certain message, but I just had to change the sharing at the last moment when I was on the pulpit. And actually the message came uh, sort of a word of knowledge to the condition that the church was in. And uh, it, it was so wonderful, you know, to, to see the Lord visit us. And uh, the Lord willing, if he gives us more time they desire if we can have, we can concentrate in that region at least for a month or so. And uh, uh, I, I trust the Lord blessed them. Amen. <clears throat> Shall we just turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation 17, verse 14? I just want to share uh, a few thoughts on. Uh, a message that I would title called Chosen and Faithful. <clears throat> Shall we just pray before we read? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence once again. Amen. as we go into the sharing of your word. Father, we want to surrender our thoughts, our mind to you, that as the word of God is being spoken, let it be spoken in faith, and let it be received in faith as well. And that, Lord, as we hear your word, our souls can be strengthened in this pathway of life, into this calling that you've brought us into. And it is by your grace that, Lord, we are here, not because we were good, but 
you for it to be so. And we desire that as we live through our lives, yes, Lord. we can grow up into perfection. Amen. Even as we see the lateness of time, there are so many things that are calling for our attention, so many cares of life. But we don't want to be the foolish virgin. We want to be wise. We want to be alert. We want to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time for the days are evil. So Lord, help us, even as we look into your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelation 17 verse 14 These shall make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them for He is Lord of Lords. Now of course this uh, is speaking about the vision John had of the Lord Jesus Christ coming on the white horse coming with the saints. And if you notice it says He is Lord of Lords. Meaning there are there are lords that he presides over. And he is king of kings. But who are these kings? Who are these lords that Jesus is lord and king over? How did they get to be with him? Did he just pick on them for, for the sake of picking them? No. The verse continues to say, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I want us to look at those three elements. Mm -hmm. They are called and chosen and faithful. Now, being called and chosen is a wonderful thing. And I believe uh, when each one of us received the message of the hour, you, you felt the grace of God upon your life because the Lord called you into His grace. He foreknew you. But, you see, when you look at being called and being chosen, it's not something that has come upon our lives because of any works we did. But when you look at the third element of being faithful, being faithful is a function of time. Being faithful is only attained after you've proven your calling, after you've been tested. So one can only be de declared faithful when he has lived through time and has demonstrated a life that has manifested the potential that God saw in him. Amen? Amen. Let's read 2 Peter 1 verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> Our excitement is not just about, I am called, I am the chosen of the Lord. Because that is freely given to us. But in 2 Peter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Amen. Now, let, let me just uh, speak the same words in NIV, uh, New International Version. It says, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. So the Lord has called us by His grace, but it doesn't end there. For us to be called faithful, there is a test which is required. You see, and that is exactly what uh, the book of Revelation chapter that should be three, verse twenty-one. Let, let us just read that one again. Revelation three, verse twenty-one. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. So there is an overcoming to do. And like Brother Branham said, uh, character is not a gift, it's a victory. Mm. So well and good, we are called, we are chosen. But the big question is, are we faithful in the calling that God has given us? Mm. 
And take note that it is what makes these people who are coming with Christ to be with him. They were called chosen and they were faithful. Right. So our rejoicing is not just a matter of I am an elect of God. I am the chosen of the Lord. The question is what have you done with what the Lord gave you? With the calling God gave you? Right. And when we speak of calling, we're not speaking of preaching and all that. Mm -hmm. Your calling into Christ, what have you done with that? With the, with, with the grace that the Lord has, That's right. has given you? And in this light, I would want us to look at a parable the Lord Jesus gave in Matthew 25. Remember the parable of the talents. I want you to take note of the calling being chosen and a test through a period of time in that parable. Mm. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants. They were called. <coughs> And delivered unto them his goods. Well, their boasting was not supposed to be in the goods they were given. We can't boast of our gifts. <laughs> right. They are freely given to us. But the big question is, what did these men do with what they were given by their Lord? Verse 15. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. That speaks of the foreknowledge of God. Right. God already knows the abilities given into us. That is why in one place of scripture it says, there is no temptation that can come your way that you can fail to overcome. Mm. Whatever comes our way, whatever trial, the Lord already measured our ability to overcome that. But our ability, the potential of our ability has to be tested through time. And when you go down in verse 19, it says, After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. <laughs> what does he reckon with them? Because he has left them over a period of time. And that period of time was a space for them to be tested of what will they make from what the Lord has given them. Now let, let us just look at that thing called time. When you look at time, it is one great important resource that God has given us. In fact, I would quote the greatest resource that you have. The greatest resource you have is not money. It's not the material things of this world. It is that thing called time. And what differentiates one person from another, even one country from another, it is time. <laughs> well, what they do with the time, how they utilize the time. You know, just, just think of your country, Singapore. If you don't know, Singapore gained its independence at almost the same time with my country, Zambia. Actually, we, we, we gained our independence earlier, 1964. Singapore gained its independence in 1965, I believe so, almost the same time. And uh, the, the last time I was here, 2014, there is a thick book I bought uh, by the, the, the late president, Lee Kuan Yew, and he was writing about how Singapore developed from a third world to a first world in merely 30 years, 30 years. In Zambia, that's quite a short period of time to develop, you know. <laughs> 30 years. But well, when you look at the two countries, the difference is quite vast. And of course, the new generation of young people, they may not fully appreciate what has transpired within these uh, 30 years. But to me, an outsider, when I look at Singapore, it's a testament of one man. I know there were so many other people who were involved, you know, after your country broke away from the Malaysian Federation. But he was the main figure behind it. And when you look at the two countries, the differences in what, in what the two countries have done within this space of time. 
There were trials to both countries, but the question is, what did they make out of the short period of time? And I believe each one of us, we are writing a story within this space called time. You are actually writing a book in time. And that book is your life. I don't know how far you've come with your book. I'm 34 years old, 34 chapters so far. <laughs> yeah. But one time, the covers of your book will have to close. Right. The question is, what story did you write? Was it just your own story? Your accomplishments? Cares of this life? The thing of it is, someone gave us the pen full with ink and the paper to write that story. And those things are not our things. But the question is, what story have we been writing? Right. As believers, as children of God, we don't want to write our personal stories. We want to be part of the life of the Word of God, according to what He desired of us. So we don't want just to write our own books, we want to be part of the book of life. And one day, your, your life is going to close, but how enough have you written your story? And you know, when you, when you talk of book writing, it is, it is something that takes up much of my time now. And well, when you are writing a book, you want to make sure the grammar is correct, every word is in its place, before you give it to the editor or to the publisher. You, you, you want to do a good work. And really, that is how our lives should be. Yeah. Our Christian life is not just about, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. If there is anything wrong in me, uh, take it out of me. Oh, you need to set your heart first yourself. How, how is my life before the Lord? Is it, is it pleasing? Because at the end of your life, later on, at one time you were young, later on you realize your muscles are not as strong as they used to be. And later on your book closes. But somewhere in the book of Revelation it says, and the books were opened and people were judged of their works. Mm -hmm. Those were not found in the book of life. But blessed are you if your life is hid with Christ in God. Because your life actually becomes <coughs> the book of life by which the world will be judged. Mm -hmm. So, through this time, our calling is being tested. God has given us a very precious message. He's given us life. But what are we doing with it? Are we going to reach that place where the Lord will say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Faithful. You made good use of what you were, you were given. Now, it's not just a story we are writing. But it's a story of trials and tests. And the highlights of our life, really, it's not about your happy moments or your joyous moments. What defines your life is what you overcome through it. And there are certain things you don't know about yourself. You are, going, you, you are only going to know them when you've been tested. When you look at Job, Job was a good man. He was wise. He was wealthy. He tried to do all he could to make sure his life, even of his children, were right before God. When you read his story, every now and then he would give a sacrifice, you know, just to make sure in case one of my children did something wrong. And in the eyes of the world, he was a good man. He was fighting a good fight of faith, you know. But there was something else God wanted out of him. And many times when we read about Job, we say, oh, Job was very strong in faith and Job was a very patient man. I remember back in, the, in my days as a Pentecostal, a preacher man would preach a sermon. Job was a very patient man. Job, you know, he endured. Then at the end of the sermon, those who want patience, you can come to the altar, you get prayed for. <laughs> so who would be prayed for? Receive patience. But really, it doesn't work that way. Yes. <laughs> Patience is not something like in a syringe, which uh, 
some holy angel comes and injects you with patience, then some, suddenly you feel, well, I'm now patient. Obviously, Job felt at one point, when everything was okay, when everything was alright, he felt, well, I think I'm doing everything right. Of course, there was another thing which was happening in the spirit. You know, when Satan said, uh, you know, he is like this because of all this and that. But you notice that after the, his children die, after his animals die, Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord, you gave, you took away. But later on, these trials take a heavy toll on Job. And when you read those chapters in the middle of the book, Job speaks certain things that, well, you feel, <laughs> where did he get the courage to speak such things? Job is really pressed to the extreme that he reaches a point of speaking words that you would never think would come out of his mouth. Just take an example of what he's, he says in the, in the 13th chapter of the book. Let, let us just read that. Job chapter 13. Let's read verse 1 to 3. And you see, this is when uh, the three men, his friends, they've been accusing him, maybe you, you did something wrong. Maybe uh, there's a case upon your life, you know, all the suspicions people had. But Job knew where he stood. One thing of it, he was, he was very sincere. Verse 1. Lo, my eye had seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What you know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. Mm -hmm. He reached a point where he says, I, I want to reason with God. You know, I want to ask him some questions. <coughs> At this point, his health has wasted away. He wasn't a job that people once used to know. Someone who was good-looking, chubby, and everything was all right. At this point, he has suffered loss of everything, except the breath he had. And he says, I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But you are forgers of lies. You are all physicians of no value. You know. And in verse 7, he continues, Will you speak wickedly for God, and talk deceitfully for Him? Will you accept His person? Will you contain for God? Now, notice verse 13. Hold your peace, let me alone, that I may speak, and let come on me what will. You, you see, at this point, Job has suffered enough that he doesn't mind what will come on him, because he, he already feels like he's dead. So he says, let me speak what I have to speak. Now, as you go down, in verse 20, he says, uh, verse 19, Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Only do not two things unto me. Now, he's telling the Lord, don't do these two things to me, then will I not hide myself from thee. Withdraw thine hand far from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. In other words, Lord, I, I desire to speak to you, but don't, don't come to me, you know, in form of fire, the wind, supernatural manifestation, because that will make me afraid. Then call thou and I'll answer, or let me speak and answer thou me. Are you able to question God like that? Lord, you manifest to me, but don't come in a fiery form which will make me afraid. In other words, speak to me like a man. I desire that you speak to me and ask me, I'll answer you. And I ask you questions and you answer me. This is a man speaking out of a broken heart. And God granted the wish of Job. Because after the three men did their speaking, there's a fourth man, a young man who came to speak. And I want us to look closely at what this fourth man said. That should be in Job chapter 33, when Elihu speaks.
This is Eli who's speaking. I want you to notice that God sent this, this man to grant the request of Job. Elihu says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. If thou canest answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up. Now, here's a young man speaking to Job, an elderly man, and he says, Put your words in order. Stand up and answer these questions that I'll ask you, Job. And in verse, verse 6, Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. According to your wish. Remember what Job said earlier? I also am formed out of the clay. I'm just a man like you, Job. So, I'll ask you questions. But I'm, I'm standing in the place of God here. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid. I haven't come in form of a whirlwind. I haven't come in form of a pillar of fire. I haven't come in form of all those things that can scare you. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid. Neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. And Elihu begins to ask questions to Job. And the interesting thing is, later on, God now manifests in form of a wind in chapter 38. And God actually speaks in a manner, a similar manner, the way Elihu spoke in Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You know, many times when we've gone through trials, you, you may speak so many things. Certain points you would feel like, God is not fair. Why me? But you know, God's ways are far higher than our ways. And many times we speak words without knowing, without knowledge. Because you are caught up in the limitation of your mind as you go through the turbulence of trials. And that is what Job went through. And God said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now notice. Get up now thy loins like a man. Same words Elihu spoke. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And then God asks Job, very deep questions, to which even to this day science has no answers. Exposing his ignorance. And later on, as you go to the final chapter, Job repents. He acknowledges the ignorance that God exposed about him in verse 3, chapter 42, verse 3. This is Job speaking. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Speaking the same words God had spoken in verse 38. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and thou speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abar myself and repent in dust and ashes. This repentance would have never come out of Job if he had never gone through his trials. And I believe Job, after this trial, knew something about himself which he had not known before he was tested. Right. There are certain things you don't know about yourself until you go through the tests of God. And when God sends these things, He doesn't send the trials to break or to destroy you. But there is a strength in us that can only manifest when we are weak. And when we realize that it is him that is in us that is greater than he that is in the world. Because God can't use us in the fullness of our flesh. And our faithfulness manifests when we allow the will of God to take preeminence within us. 
And those are the people that Jesus is going to come with who are called, chosen, and they are faithful. One thing we see when we read the book of Revelation 3, verse 20, where the Lord said, Him that, I mean, just like I overcame and sat in the throne, you have to overcome and sit in the throne with Him. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus went through. He was baptized with water, filled with the Holy Spirit, but there was that fire that came upon the Lord Jesus. When you read Hebrews, he says he cried. He lent obedience through the things which he suffered. Amen. And therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. There was an overcoming which needed to be done. Right. Until he was in a state that he was supposed to be in. So there is a process of time in which we have to prove our calling. In which we have to confirm our calling. So think about your life within this space of time. Mm -hmm. Is it something God can look at today and say, you are faithful? Or is your mind full of your will and what you desire? Have you reached a place where God has broken you? A place where you can say like Paul, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ in me. You know, Paul had burdens. Paul had prayer requests as well. Remember, he prayed for the sick out of his handkerchiefs. Healings took place. If he was a modern Pentecostal, you would expect everything he speaks, God would grant him. No, it wasn't like that. He had a trouble. He called it the message of Satan that made him so weak. And he sought the Lord over it. He says three times, I sought the Lord. It is something that always troubled him for him to say, I sought the Lord three times. In other words, it was a big burden that weighed him down. You know. What did the Lord answer him? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. God didn't heal him of that. My grace is sufficient for you. God's ways are not our ways. Mm -hmm. Your life needs to reach a place where you rest in the hands of the potter. And he shapes you as, you, as he desires. The thing is, do you let God do his work upon your life? You've been called, you've been chosen. But we're not just excited in those things. Our daily life is a story we are writing. And what defines that story is not our happy moments. It's not when you smile. It's, it's when you overcome the tests that come your way. That is what defines you. That is what defines your spiritual life. So you're writing a book, and you need to write it very well. When a trial comes in your way, it's not time to, to doubt your calling. It's time to say, well, let me now do the best I can to show that my standing with the Lord is not based on what good thing he can do for me. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were threatened with the fire. You'll be thrown in the fire. But notice their faith. Notice their faithfulness. They said, God is able to save us from the fire. He's able. He is more than able. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down to the image. I want you to always remember this gospel which has made us come together here. It is stained with blood. Men were beheaded. To stand for the faith that you and I come for here, you know. Apostles suffered for this thing. Lives died. Even during the dark ages, there were people who stood faithfully. Ultimately, for, 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 for us to read, to have, just for us to have the Bible in English, where you can understand the language, 
just the work of translating it, it costed people's lives, you know. There's a life, there are many lives of faithful people behind that book you're holding in your hands. The thing is, how much worth does it have? How much worth is it in your hands? Because you can make this worthwhile book become worthless by the kind of life you live. Right. What kind of a Christian life do you have? Is it just something you come and you sing some songs and you pray and then your everyday life is just another routine of cares of this life? Or do you have a personal relationship with God? Do you have a life which God can say it is a faithful life in his hands? That is what will matter before God. How faithful you've been with what he has given in your hands. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, You've put life within us. And we are standing, walking every day on this planet. And it really looks big in our eyes. But it stands as a little speck of dust in the big immense universe. And behind it all we know you created the heavens and the earth. And you didn't just bring it forth for nothing. You didn't just bring it forth for us to, to wake up, eat food, and fulfill our own personal desires and let our own die. If that is all there is to life, oh Lord, then it's all vanity. But Lord, we know you are there. For you've done something wonderful upon our hearts that we can say today and we can sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Amen. That saved wretched sinners like us. And when we beheld your grace, we can say, we've woken up to the reality of life. We've woken up to your eternal purposes. Yes. And we know that on that day you won't judge us by kind of things of this world but by how faithful we've been to the wonderful gift of life that you gave us. How faithful we've been in your presence. For in the beginning, you desired a family. Oh Lord, we pray, have mercy upon us that we may make good use of the grace that you gave us. We've been called, we've been chosen, we know that, Lord. Yes. But we desire that our lives be worthy of the gospel whereunto you've called us to. So we thank you for this gathering and it is my prayer that you bless every soul that is under the roof of this room. There are others who are going through trials, trials of health, different circumstances and situations. Because Lord, this is the nature of the world we find ourselves in. It is still in the hands of the Prince of Darkness. And although we are in the world, we are strengthened to know that we are not of this world. And we know that better things are coming ahead. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, hold our hands like little children, and guide us through this life. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. Today is my last day here. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll be going back to, to Zambia. And uh, I would just like to express my thanks for the wonderful little time we had together. <coughs> Uh, especially the family of uh, Brother Henry and his wife. Uh, I would like to appreciate them for their love and their care and all the things. <coughs> and uh, continue praying for us. Yeah, uh, so many battles going on, you know, uh, in the message. But we are determined to stand for the word of God and we believe the Lord is doing a work in the bride of Christ scattered around the world and uh, we always remember you in our prayers because we believe this fellowship stands something that is bigger than the confinement of this room you know and I just encourage you to be 
to be faithful <laughs> because you have a bigger responsibility <coughs> on your shoulders. I was reading about your country one time, it was a trading post where business people just used to pass through as they move on to other places. And it has become sort of that place whenever we come to Asia, we stop by here to go in these other places <laughs> in spreading the word of God. So out of, out of the bottom of my heart, I say, may God richly bless you. Amen. God bless you. You know, traveling to the Philippines can be uh, quite a tough uh, journey when you have to ministers to churches in different islands and you fly over here and then maybe take a ferry or go by road into the <coughs> province. It can make a person very tired. Um, I always say that I believe that, like uh, Brother Andrew said, reckoning of time. And we know that we must count our time, the time we spend. We have only 24 hours a day. I think practically some of us sleep eight hours. It may, may not be maybe six hours, but you'll be tossing, turning in the bed before you get up and probably eight hours pass away. You get up and you do your chores and you go to work and you come back and you have a little time for yourself. Maybe you know you work eight hours, come back and me, you spend that time watching movie or play some computer game, I do not know. Or read the papers and stuff like that. And we are writing a book, as Brother Andrew said, and that's very true because we already have a book of life. This, this, this is the book of life. We know that, and this book records the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and records about the activities of all that were members of his own body, how he deal with the member of his body. So when we are in this life ourselves here writing the book, how we write this book is important too because it's not about ourselves, just about ourselves, about achievement, you know, the wealth we have and things like that, our happiness and our frustration, but also that our life affects everybody in this life. True. You, 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 we are not you know what we call one, one man in an island. And if you are to live in an island all by yourself, you go mad. A lot of people think, well, I just want to be alone, you know, like the hermits. At least the hermits and monks, they go up to the mountain and they sit down there and meditate. But some people, I don't know what they meditate. And in this life here, we are, we are not on an island by ourselves. We, will get in, we have contact with people. And our life, the story that we write, is shared with the people that we mix with. It has a, an effect. And that's why the, 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 the book of life that record about our Lord and Savior. It affects of a lot of people. His life affects them when he walk with them, talk with them. So when you talk about the calling, now I mean, I, to me, I'm, when I talk about, I mean, when I do talk about the calling, we're talking about God calling us into the family of God, being a part of the body of Christ. But to each and every one of us are given a talent. I don't do maybe five or whatever you have as given by the parable. We all have a talent, a gift. What do you do with it? Besides not only just the gift of eternal life, but every one of us have a gift. You may not realize it. You may not know what gift that God has given you. Um, maybe you, you give is a, you know, pray for the church and instrument, things like that. You know, all your life is such that, you know, you have this uh, love and care towards another. You know. You know, I, I want to say this, that my brother, Jimmy, you know, he, he really spent a lot of time dealing with uh, the books and sending out books. And of course, uh, 
to do all those years to take care even when we fellowship in the house. You know, the wife's there, the two children, two Sunday. You know, the home has to be put, the chair has to be put out when we fellowship them. And even while we are here, he comes early to just make sure that the room is air. He is writing a history. And every one of us have. But many times, as you all know, our story is all about ourselves. It has nothing to do with anybody else. We want to write a story where I have my achievement. I, I want my happiness. I want my time to spend for myself. The only thing about time spent for yourself is selfish time. You know? It's not like the iPhone say FaceTime. At least come face to face with people and relate. But time spent for our own self. Sit down at home, play a game, watch a movie, or do it. Don't bother by anybody else. When there is a need arose, arise in the church, members in the body of Christ, what do we do? Do we just, okay, see a brother not coming here and all this? Take a phone. No, everything is, brother God has to do it. So everything has to be done by me. You know, so and so didn't turn up, so and so didn't turn up for the last few weeks. Brother again, it's my responsibility to call him up. And how many of you ever called up a brother or sister who have not been here for some time? No, that's not my job, that's Brother Gunn's job. That's how I said this. Back in those early years, when I went to America and attended this convention, uh, thinking highly of this young man who might be used of the Lord to really, you know, uh, cry out against the fanaticism and the anti-message. But it turned out to be something different. <coughs> he wasn't what we thought he was. A brother was with me, you know, we decided to go to the convention. Well, you know, uh, I guess he was hurt by by telling him and giving him a feedback. That's a lot of people that don't like feedback. Even the one over recently in Belgium doesn't like feedback. No reply, nothing. And even the promise to send me tapes and all this by both ministers, they never did. Even one of them, when I give an offering for the postage, nothing come, nothing came. But after a couple of years down the road, you know, uh, a brother called to me from America, the same brother who went with me to the convention. He told me a brother again, he's seeking help from you. Whether you have been to this country or not, because two of his ambassadors of Forana, where you want to call them, you know, to prepare the way for his uh, meeting there, uh, to, he, they were stranded. He's asking me to find out from you whether you know about this country, you know, what's happening out there, something. And then I said, no, I've not been to that particular country. Then I asked this, but I said, uh, what all of these years he looked for my help? When even the, he, he never even sent me the tape when I gave him, well, not, more than enough money to cover the postage. You know, he said, yes, Bergan, I asked him, he said, do you know that Bergan sent you two or three letters? And he's waiting for your reply all these years. And this brother told me, he said, you know what the pastor said, what the preacher said? Brother, I'm very busy. Busy. In those days when you talk about slow mail, you talk about slow mail. Do you know how many letters comes into my box, P.O. Box 333? Back in those days, it was 301. Do you know how many letters I get from India, from Philippines, from Africa? That I have to answer every one of them. And how many did he get actually? Compare. And yet he doesn't even have a time to take a piece of paper and write to me. He said, Brother God, I received your letter. Thank you so much. I'll try to reply in due course. No. I see a lot of ministers out there. That's not what we are writing a, your story. 
people that you're writing a story, you may have a mask over the eyes of people when they see you writing the story. Because there is a covering up of the reality, only God knows. You know what I'm saying? Because many times we have two sides, two faces. We show the good face to people. We hide the bad face. Only God knows that bad face. You know. So I find this, there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of insincerity. And you know, it just made me sick because how can it be that ministers who are called preachers, men of God, preaching the word of God, and can play this sort of thing? I mean, if you are a preacher, you want to hide at home and drink beer and get drunk. That's one thing. But I'm talking about sincerity when you deal with the brother or the sisters. Why are you hiding these things? And tell lies, tells lies. You know. So that's one of the things that I noticed that uh, that's why I don't want to feel like going to Europe. I don't want to go to America. Because there's no place for me to go now. That, because I've been there a few times in my preach. But behind my back, everything is now, that's not true. Now, so that's okay. You know, you tell me, it's a, I don't quite agree with it. I don't agree. That's okay. But go around saying things, the twisting words, they're very dangerous. We're writing a life, we're writing a story. And when God called me into this ministry, He gave me this gift. I didn't ask for it, as Bob would say, you know, I. I'm just a servant, as Barbara would say, you know, the gift that God gave him, the discerning and all this, he says, uh, I have nothing to do with it. So, my belief is since, I believe what God said, what Paul wrote, that the church will be perfected through the fivefold ministry. And it is this fivefold ministry that perfects the church until the coming of Christ. Because if the church is not perfected, not come to their place of maturity, you know, and completeness. If they don't come to that place, that means they're still tossing to and fro with this doctrine, that doctrine, changing the mind, and all this sort of thing. And not knowing what to do. And this is actually what happened over the in Philippines. So those years that I've seen now, many preachers have changed, moving back and forth. Now, if we do not have the gift, why push that we have that gift? Why are a lot of people trying to be apostles? That's what I was wondering. And they try to be apostles because they had a little something. They say, oh, I planted a church there. Therefore, I'm an apostle. Because that's basically what the word was used. But then the deeper thing about an apostle is a set out of all the barbarian said direct. Define it, and that is very correct. Look into carefully in the book. An, an apostle is the one who set things in order. You know. Because Paul taught Timothy, Titus, Savannah, all that was under him. And he told who? He told, was it Titus? He told him, when you go to Greek, set those things that are lacking in order. Because he was taught by Paul. And Paul considered him as a Paul, consider some of, some of those below him because they follow him and they learn from him, he called them, uh, including them as apostles. You know. So apostles are people who are able to set things in order, not make a mess of the word of God twisted here and there that will be seen in many countries. Two souls. Polygamy marriage, you are allowed to have another wife if you want to. Hmm? Satan still can have access to heaven. And a lot of other things. It really scare me. And there are always times that, you know, I was wondering. You know, when I was in the denomination, I was caught up in studying the word, but I was guided. I was guided by the system's theology. And even when you talk about the three days and three nights, the sign that Christ gave to the Pharisees, because they are asking for a sign, but uh, there will be no sign given except the sign of Jonah. 
And she was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be in the hearts of the earth. Three days and three nights. So back then, you know, I was thinking, wow. That's great. You know, I have already studied the fees of Jehovah. Back then in the system. And I know that the fees of Jehovah. Uh, what they call prophesied of all. Depict the life of Christ. In his ministry. And yet. One day. And there was this article about three days and three nights. That Christ died on Wednesday. Evening. And right selected. Before the sun rise on Sunday. Still on Sabbath day. So three days and three nights. Look very correct. Because the disciple went to the tomb. And early in the morning before the sunrise. Whatever. They couldn't find him. You know. So I was learning there at that time. I said wow this is correct. I even drew a chart on it. Look at it very carefully. 12 hour days. Times three. 12 hour night. Times three. Three days, three nights. When I came to the message, when I push all that thing out, I write a new book. I began to write a new book. When I sat down one day and then look at the face again, I said, my goodness, why am I changing my mind from the death of Christ on a Friday to a Wednesday or to a Thursday to try to fit in these three days, three nights thing? Because it is the feast of Jehovah that Christ fulfilled it. That we can see exactly according to the scripture. So he couldn't have died on a Wednesday or a Thursday. You see, no wonder the Bible tells us to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. So if we are out from this world into Christ, we are into the book of Christ. We are into the very story that Christ is telling about you and me, about him. And so we are just another branch of the tree of life. We are just another page out of the beast book, which we are writing our own story. So how do we write the story? Are we looking at ourselves and consider our relationship with people and care? No wonder, you know, Bible talks about faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of all this is charity, agape. There's nothing greater than agape. So you cannot say, well, everything is born again and all this. I know it's my, my ministry. But in the body of Christ, as Paul talks about, there are many members, different. The ears, the eyes, the nose, and toes, and fingers, and all this, Right? And none of these members can say to the other, I have no need of you because you are not an eye. But I am an eye. So you are not an eye, you are here, I don't need of you. No. So we need to be able to relate our story with the other. Then our life story will be complete. Because Christ came into the world not to be served, but to serve. And to serve others is not an easy thing. Sometimes we find hard. I'm not talking about being a waitress. That's your job. I'm talking about going out and really do something. I was watching a you on the YouTube. I mean, you know, sometimes I was looking at some uh, brother who sent me a YouTube, uh, somebody preaching and things like that. And then on the site there, you know, there's always this video. And that's how I look at it. And I was kind of curious about... This fellow was saying that, you know, uh, uh, a homeless man was given a, a, a pizza and see what happened next. Surprise! So I got a curious, what was it? So this guy was making all the video and he went up there to a homeless... No, first of all, he walked around looking at people who have pizza, you know, eating and said, can I have a slice? Then people said, no. I cannot give you a slice for myself. So he went to others, you know, well-dressed people were... Uh, who have pizza, you know, a few other pizza, can I have they would. So then he would take a, he would buy a box of pizza and went to a homeless man and give to a homeless man. You have not been eating, eating anything for the lady, right? Okay, have this box of pizza. And the man was very happy. Thank you, thank you. He sit there and eat. And then another guy will come up there to him, to this homeless man. 
Oh, can I have a one piece of pizza? The homeless man, sure, sure. And the man, the whole thing is this. The rich people refuse to share. The poor and the homeless will share. Right. That, that's one, one story we should know. That is very true. The, the rich find hard to enter into the eyes of the needle into the kingdom of God. Hmm? So, do we care for our own body? The homeless man say, we are homeless. We are homeless, you know, we are poor. We are poor, so let us share. Care for one another. But to the rich, mm -mm. that's my empire. I'm a multi-millionaire in my bank account. Now, you know, one of the interesting things that happened lately, last week or so, was this chicken rice man, chicken rice store owner, right? I guess he's a, he's a millionaire. I mean, another tipsy. He must be a little drunk, of course. And then, what did he do? What did he say to the cabbie, taxi driver? Took out his thousand dollar bill and said, you know, you're, you're nobody. You know what, he, what was in the paper? It was, oh my. Then later he realized, my goodness, he said this thing. And he apologized. You know what apology is? That's why I said, a true apology is not saying, brother, I'm sorry. If there is something to be done right, there must be restitution. The Bible talks about it. If you damage somebody's life, somebody's thing, you don't just say, I'm sorry. You make a man. Restitution must be done. If you damage somebody's car, don't just say, man, I'm sorry. You've got to pay restitution. That's right. You know. So this is the thing, you know, I was, I was thinking, well, the man did the really, he really said, um, you know, give them the chicken rice free, the, you know, the, 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 the taxi driver. I mean, they're all very happy, the man, you know, accept his apology, you know. This is what, about writing the story. The chicken rice man wrote his story. He did it wrong the first time, he make a mess, now he correct it, right? And now you will remember him for the rest of my life. If I were to see him, I would shake his hand and say, you did the right thing. A good example. Hmm. It's not easy to do, huh? What are they saying about the thoughts that comes in? And that's why when a person is tipsy, ha, huh, everything comes up from his mouth. And the same thing with us. As I say about these thoughts that flies all around us, we keep collecting it, and we just emphasize, hang on to something. And you know, about somebody or something, we make it very big, we keep piling it up. Yes. We pile it up. A couple of days ago, I'll show you, I mean, I, I talk about it on Friday, but let me say this. I had this dream, particular dream. You know how dreams were, it just pop up in some way and things like that. And there was this brother in the fellowship who had done wrong things and long time ago, left the church and all these things. And have all kinds of uh, uh, what we call excuses. And there was not even one word of apology. There was no sign of he was really remorseful remorse about what he did. No. He felt that what he did was right. And was, I was very upset for a long time. The second of character can be. Far out there are a lot of people, as I said, are two-faced. But in the dream I had it's about a week or so ago, I found myself among a group of believers but I couldn't see everybody's face except his face. You know? And I went up to him. And I just hugged him. Now this is something I would not do. In reality, because I'm fed up with the, the attitude of people. But I began to realize is that if God, Christ, overlook our fault, he looked beyond our fault and he see my need. So why would I want to hold on to those things? That's the reason why 
For years, I'm, turning, I'm claiming my mind is out of it. The thing that happened in the church, the thing that people say towards one another and cause this problem, I want to clear it up. And you know what I just said? There's a time now that we are, it's just closing. And if you think the Christ is not coming soon, there is still maybe another 10 years to go. You know why I told the Lord, I, want to, I don't want to be an old man. Israel really 70 years coming up next year. So how much more time do we have? And yet, the war is already very imminent in the Middle East. And that earthquake in California is overdue. Do you know there are so many signs, the scientists are always finding out there's a lot of places cracking up. Even they were so worried about that San Francisco rainfall a couple of weeks ago. There was, they said it was unprecedented that there's so much rain recorded. And the water rain went into the cracks of the earth and it's actually splitting it. Do you know how powerful water is? And under out there, the Yellowstone, Colorado, there is this volcano, the activity is there. Even in Southern Lake, they say there's still a lot of, a lot of little quick boiling up, boiling up more and more each time. So how much time do we have? If not this year, next year. If not next year, when then? You want to hold it back? And so what Barbara prophesied that Hollywood, the field of the world, Sodom and Gomorrah is right there. Time is already past judgment. You know. And all the years that China have been after after Mao Zedong, they try to rebuild themselves to come back to a little bit more of a democratic country. And see how they expand. You know, America still boasts that that their weapon is superior than anybody else. So what? You, know, you may have a lot of weapon, it may be big, like Goliath. It doesn't take another Goliath to beat another Goliath. Take a little David. That's all. And China is built on army, North Korea, what do you think? What do you think is happening over this part? The whole world is in a mess. And the people who are talking about the environmental issue, what is happening now to the environment? Look at the environment. How bad it really is. The trees. Do you have, have you ever been to the airport toilet? I think it's in the airport toilet. Some of these toilet there. You know, they, you wash your hand and you have a paper towel you pull down. There will be a sign there. It says, you draw a tree there. When these are gone, so would be the paper. <coughs> How many trees have been cut down just to make paper for you to wipe your hand in through? Instead of using a towel. Paper are so hygienic. Do you know in those days, you don't have paper to wipe your hand. There's a piece of cloth that you pull down. You wipe, you pull down. Alright, you keep on circulating. Oh, that is dirty because it's recycling inside there. Oh, we are so clean. I know a lot of people, some women go out there and then they buy this sanitation thing. And they keep on washing their hand. Come on! You put your hand on the table, shake somebody's hand, you take a banana or whatever fruit you eat. It's not going to kill you. Because thus we are. Thus we shall go back. It's not that you shake a hand of somebody who is infectious with some disease. Then you don't want to die in the days of SAR, right? Yeah. You know. So when we get to a place where the whole environment is of the earth is so destroyed. What was the news recently, only last few days ago? What about happened to the Arctic Circle? The ice, the shelf has moved. And one, you will be surprised that you ask the uh, meteorological, I don't know what you call that, all the people who uh, check the surface of our island. 
I can't remember who belonged, environment ministry or what, any or what. You do you know, you could tell you that the water of the ocean, Singapore is sinking, not actually sinking, but the water is rising. The water is rising. And in the Red Sea area where that, what we call the Great Continental Divide, huh? do you know that it's moving already every year? I don't know how many cm it's opening up. That's the place for the long crack of quick. It will come down all the way from Tunisia down to Mozambique downwards. The world is in this situation because men have destroyed it. And when man's sin is built up to a level, God has to put that to a stop and judge. Or else they will destroy everyone. Or else everyone or men will destroy themselves, so to speak. But God is not going <coughs> to allow it. He's going to bring the whole system to a close. But you and I here, are we preparing ourselves for His coming? And the book that we are writing, do, do, do you, have you been writing a good book about yourself or lately? So many years back, the day you became a Christian, whether it's five years, ten years, twenty years back, have you been writing your book, a good gospel book of yourself, so to speak? But I thank God when God called me, and then He gave me this ministry. I do my best. I believe in a five-fold ministry. That's why I don't even know whether how many churches in the world. I mean, in the entire message, they said they believe in a five-fold ministry. Actually, support a five-fold ministry. But one thing I know, in many countries up there in Europe, or America, or Canada, convention day comes, all the ministers will come together from different countries. You know. But how many will send or help to send a brother who is in who have a ministry to go to another country to be a blessing to others? That's what we have. We do this. We get people like Brother Nice, Brother James Verumore, Brother Andrew Piri, even Brother Shadrach, even Brother Osa who came. I will try to see all those that have a ministry to move so that we will all be admonished, exhorted, build up, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And your part that you play in the tithes and offering that you give, we are doing just that. You know, yes, this month or last month, the time when Brother Shaker came, Brother Andrew, and also Brother Nice, now with all that they are moving, we are just sending him some money also for him to move to West Africa. So it takes a whole lot of money. In fact, uh, we spent about another nearly $30,000 already. So a lot of money are involved when we help brothers and sisters in other country because why? It's not all about ourselves here. It's all about our attachment to the body of Christ, our effect upon the others of our life that we want. So I pray that every one of you, you know, as a believer, speak the right thing. Act the Christian way. Don't have all the wrong thoughts in your head. Don't have evil thinking. Forgive. Very hard to forgive, I know, many times. It's so painful because you're hurt bad. Isn't it? That's why Job, yeah, I know, you know, that's true. He was frustrated to the point that he just simply uttered words. I mean, God understands your frustration. But still God is waiting on you to come to Him. If you speak honestly to the Lord in your frustration, but not just brush Him away. Not like Cain. When God gave him the sacrifice, He doesn't want it. Brush it off and turn and walk away. No. 
You get frustrated with God? Yes, you can. Because God understands your frustration. He understands your pain, your passion, because Christ has been through it. And if you want to talk to God, that's when God will say, tell you, stand. Stand up now. Because if you want to have, have an answer from me, you need to be able to understand that my word that I speak to you is going to make you perfect, mature your life. Stand up, Job. Where were you? Answer me if you can. When I lay the foundation of the wall, the stars shout up for joy. And the sons of God sing and shout, Where were you? Have you entered into the treasure of the snow? Did you know that the world is round, hang on nothing? So was the oldest book in the Bible. The oldest book. But it's placed right in the center of the Bible. So where were you? So don't think that you, we know a lot of things. You know? And this is not when we do not know things, don't speak. That's what Job said, I speak what I do not know. And there are a lot of people that speak what they do not know. They think they know what they don't know. And they utter it. And make a mess of the message that God gave us. Don't speak until you know. And when you talk to people, when you share with brother and sister, please remember. Do not utter words that hurt. Right? Utter words that is an exaltation and admonition to brother and sister. I pray that will help every one of us in this hour. All right, shall we stand and we'll just worship the Lord a little? When he reached down his hand for me. <clears throat> Once my soul was astray from the heaven and was fashioned and fought as
such a wonderful God and Father to us all. And we live in this generation 6,000 years since the beginning of mankind. And this is a generation, this age we have this revelation of your word that you have in this last day, Lord, unfold to us that we have a clearer picture. As Job would say, once I heard, but he said, now I see. And you have given us these eyes to see, Lord, the, the wondrous treasure of thy word. And Lord, in the world out there, people are just wandering in darkness. Lord, it seems so unfair that we are such a privileged people. And when we see the masses of people, Lord, walking to and fro, going about their everyday life. What can we say, Father? To know that you have chosen us, called us. But help us to remember that there is always a responsibility, Father, when you call us you want us to shine forth for you, for you, Lord. As the little song would go, a little candle in the night. You in your own corner and I in mine. And we all are the light of the world, the salt of this earth too. And so you left, if our salt to lose its savor, then what good is the salt? And how true that is, Father. You have taught us so many things out of this book of yours. 
You have recorded all the the pilgrims of the saints of old, their footsteps upon the sand of time, their lives of ups and downs, life of sorrow, life of happiness, and how that they pass through the life, even no matter how difficult it is, they, they were faithful until that. You have written that down in this book, Father, a manual. Not only just a book of life, but the instruction is there. The examples are there for us to follow. And how can we have an excuse, O oh Lord, in the day when we stand before you? When our book that we have written bears no proper record of a life that glorifies thy name. So, Father, we are really thankful. Very thankful, Lord. Because this is our word of time. This is the the age that we're going to see the return of Christ, the whole world will be renewed in the regenerations under our Lord and Savior's rule. And all those things, they are still waiting for us. They will not be completed without us. And they are waiting. So Father, we want to thank you now. May our walk with you, Lord, be serious now in this hour we leave you now. Because of the hour that we, we are in now, Lord, just not much time left. And the world will just continue, Lord, with all this program. You know, building up a utopia war or something. Technology will still continue to be getting better and better and better. But Lord, we know what man build, man will destroy. But that's that, that we, something we don't worry about. Because man even have been destroying this earth, the environment, the water, the sea, the air. But Lord, we are a people now, we get to live the life for you and write a good book about our life and our relationship with people and the gospel that we have, that the light of Christ might be glorified. So we thank you, Father. Bless us then, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a time when my heart was so low.